Homeostasis means the maintenance of a steady internal environment. Such internal environments include body temperature, glucose concentration of the blood, as well as water levels of the blood. It's important that our body temperature remains fairly constant because if it rises too high, enzymes may be denatured, killing cells. If it's too low, then enzyme control reactions occur too slowly. The skin is super important in thermoregulation, that means the control of our body temperature, but the skin has several other roles. First of all, it acts as a barrier preventing pathogen entry. It contains melanin, which absorbs harmful UV rays from the sun, helping to prevent skin cancer. It's also an organ of excretion. Remember, the skin excretes sweat. But how does the skin help us control our temperature? How does it carry out thermoregulation? Let's think about when we're too cold. When we're too cold, our hairs on our skin stand up on end, trapping a layer of insulating air close to the skin, meaning that we're kept warmer in this way. Other mechanisms involved include shivering when our muscles contract, releasing heat. Vasoconstriction occurs in the arterioles in our skin. Remember, vasoconstriction means the narrowing of, of these arterioles, meaning that less blood flows close to the skin, less heat is radiated. Sorry about the seagulls. What about when we're too hot? This time you'll see vasodilation occur. This is when the arterioles dilate, more blood flows close to our skin, more heat is radiated. Our hairs on our skin lay flat, less insulating air is trapped. Sweating occurs. As sweat evaporates, it helps to cool the body. The layer of the skin are as follows. You've got the epidermis, which is the top layer, the dermis, and then the subcutaneous fat, which sits underneath this layer. Thermoregulation is a good example of negative feedback. This means that when a change occurs to the environment, mechanisms are brought about within our body to oppose that change. So for example, using when we're too hot as an example, first of all, we need to detect the change in temperature. Thermoreceptors detect that we're too hot. Nerve impulses are sent to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus sends nerve impulses to the skin, increasing sweating, causing our hairs to lay flat causing vasodilation to the arterioles supplying our skin. As a result of all these processes, our body temperature decreases and our normal body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius is restored. And then the opposite occurs if we're too cold. But again, the hypothalamus is responsible for regulating all the processes that will help increase our body temperature. A second type of homeostatic mechanism you need to be aware of is known as osmoregulation. Remember, osmo means anything relating to water, so osmoregulation is all about controlling our blood water levels. The super important organ involved with osmoregulation is the kidney, but do remember that the kidney has two roles. It controls blood water levels, but it also excretes the substance urea. Remember, excretion is the removal of metabolic waste from our bodies, Substances which are excreted include sweat from the skin, carbon dioxide from the lungs, and then focusing in on the kidney, urea from the kidney, and that urea is excreted in urine. You have two kidneys. They're two fist-sized organs found in the lower portion of your back. They have various vessels which feed into and out of them. The blood vessel supplying oxygenated blood to the kidneys is known as the renal artery, the blood vessel removing deoxygenated blood from the kidneys is known as the renal vein. In terms of the layers of the kidney, the outermost layer is known as the cortex, the middle portion is known as the medulla, and then you have what's known as the pelvis. Now, the kidney contains millions of tiny structures known as the nephron, and it's important that you know the structure of the nephron inside out. The blood vessel which enters the nephron is known as the glomerulus. It's important that you're aware that the structure of the glomerulus is such that the blood vessel coming into it is wider than the blood vessel leaving, and that has important implications when we consider pressure. The first part of the nephron is known as the Bowman's capsule, and then you enter the first coil tube, which unfortunately you need to be able to describe its full name of proximal convoluted tubule. We move into the loop of Henle or loop of Henley. Then we move into the second coil tube, known as the distal convoluted tubule, before entering the collecting duct. That feeds into the ureter, which supplies the bladder with urine. Now, at the glomerulus Bowman's capsule boundary, a process known as ultrafiltration occurs. So ultrafiltration really means small molecules such as water, ions, urea and glucose are moved from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule under pressure. Now that pressure comes from the fact that the blood vessel entering the glomerulus is wider than the one leaving, generating pressure to force those small molecules out of the blood. 
Do note that things like proteins are too large to enter the Bowman's capsule and they remain in the blood. And if there's any protein present in your urine, then that can indicate damage to either the glomerulus or the Bowman's capsule because it means the pressure is so great that those proteins have entered the nephron when ordinarily they would stay in the blood. The next process you need to be aware of is known as selective reabsorption. So if you consider the contents of the nephron, it contains ions, urea, glucose, water. Obviously it's important for our body that we retain as much glucose as possible, otherwise what was the point of us eating? Food containing glucose, the point of our digestive system trying to absorb that glucose through the wall of the small intestine, it's because we want that glucose in our blood. But at this point it's entered the proximal convoluted tubule. So selective reabsorption is really taking back that glucose and some ions back into the blood. It occurs at the proximal convoluted tubule and crucially it occurs by active transport and that's because the glucose moves from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Therefore there's the requirement of energy from ATP. So what that means is that the urea is allowed to stay in the nephron where it joins the ureter, is added to the urine and that point can be excreted from the body. So selective reabsorption and ultrafiltration are really important in the excretion of urea. What about the osmoregulatory role of the kidney? So we're going to take two scenarios, one when we've had too little to drink and one when we've had a lot to drink. So what happens when we have too little to drink? Well, obviously we want to retain as much water as possible in the blood and the following steps occur in order to do this. So first of all, we have osmoreceptors present in the hypothalamus in our brain. These detect the low water levels of our blood. They send a signal to the pituitary gland to release more of the hormone ADH. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. The ADH travels in the blood to the nephron and specifically it acts on the walls of the collecting duct, making them more permeable to water. This means that more water is reabsorbed into the blood, less water is available to make urine, so resulting urine is concentrated, yellow in colour, low in volume. But what about when we've had lots to drink? Well, we're going to just learn those same steps but use slightly different wording. This time our osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus detect high water levels in the blood. The pituitary gland therefore secretes less ADH. The ADH travels to the collecting duct in the nephron. It makes the walls of the collecting duct less permeable to water, meaning that less water is reabsorbed, meaning that resulting urine is high in volume and dilute and light in colour. Where does the substance urea actually come from? Well, our bodies are unable to store excess protein, that protein gets broken down into amino acids. The amine group is removed from the amino acids in a process known as deamination, and this actually takes place in the liver. Remember, if there's glucose present in your urine, that also indicates there's a malfunctioning of the kidney, because remember that glucose should all have been reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. If there's glucose present, then it means that something has happened at the proximal convoluted tubule. Now to discuss the control of blood glucose, another example of homeostasis. So after a meal you're going to have lots of glucose in your body and your body can't just store that glucose as it is because glucose is highly soluble meaning that it has a strong osmotic effect. It draws water effectively into and out of cells. So in this case what happens when you've had lots of glucose in your diet your pancreas will secrete the hormone insulin. Insulin causes the conversion of soluble glucose into insoluble glycogen and that glycogen is stored in the liver, therefore decreasing blood glucose levels. What happens if you haven't eaten in a while? This time, your pancreas secretes the hormone glucagon. The hormone glucagon causes insoluble glycogen to be converted to soluble glucose, and that glucose is released into the blood, therefore increasing blood glucose levels. This is yet another example of negative feedback. When a change occurs, processes are brought about which oppose that change that was made. So in the case of when you've eaten lots of sugar, processes occur to decrease our blood sugar levels, and then the opposite occurs if you haven't eaten any sugar. 